afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Randall. I'm a former law school dean and the founder and president of ILaw, a Barbary company. And on behalf of myself and my co-host and partner, Kelly Testy, we're delighted to welcome you to the December installment of Live with Kelly and Ken. Now, today we have a most important subject with four wonderful speakers joining us. Uh, and we will be focusing on diversity and inclusivity in legal education. I want to tell you who our four speakers are. For the first time, we have a non-law school dean with us. We're delighted to have Ms. Cassandra Ogden with us, the CEO of Clio Inc. We also have three deans, Dean Jen Rosado Perea, the Dean of DePaul, Dean Henry Butler, the Dean of the Scalia Law School at George Mason University, and Dean Kevin Washburn, the Dean of the University of Iowa. We've asked our deans before we start the dialogue each to make some opening remarks about their ideas on diversity and inclusivity at their law schools or in legal education. Dean Washburn, we'd like for you to start if you would. Thank you. It's a real honor to be on the, on the show. So it's a, it's a challenge um, achieving diversity. It's a challenge at wherever you are. I have been the dean of the University of New Mexico School of Law, and it's a majority minority state, the very first one in the United States, and diversity presented challenges there. And I'm now in Iowa, which is one of the least diverse states in the country. The demographics here are challenging for diversity. That said, it's also an opportunity. Um, we all know that diversity is important. Uh, we make better decisions. There are all sorts of justice reasons to try to achieve diversity, but there are important practical decisions to achieve diversity. There's important practical reasons. We make better decisions as a society or in any, every team level when we have a diverse group and we consult everyone in the group. So I, I, I hope that we can um, help to move this forward a little bit. I am so grateful for the dramatic commitment to diversity and I it feels stronger now than it ever has in my lifetime, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, so I'm grateful to have be part of this discussion today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dean Washburn. Dean Jenner's out of Perea. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, great. Good afternoon. Good to be here with everybody to talk about this really important issue. As Kevin said, this, is, uh, this issue is more important than ever, more pervasive than ever, more challenging than ever. And it seems to me there's kind of three points, and hopefully we'll get to these as we uh, get, uh, go through our, our time together. One is pipelining. How do we bring students into law school? Students that have uh, been uh, suffering under structural barriers, and students that, as we know from the before the J study may not have access to the information that they need before they go to law school. Uh, secondly, I think there are issues in the admissions process itself. How do we bring in the best, the brightest, the most diverse to meet the needs of our law schools as well as our profession? I think there's uh, the holistic admissions analysis and process, which I hope we'll talk about, tries to get at things as not just academic achievement, but also the, the issues of character and work ethic and perseverance that are really important to lawyering. And that's been a continuing, I think, a continuing challenge and opportunity for us to have an admissions process that really brings in uh, the best and most diverse student body. And I think the third, and I think very important, and one that has been coming to the fore, I think, even more now than, the, than 10 years ago when I first began as a dean, is the student experience. And that's where I think inclusivity comes in, is how do we create a student experience that really treats people, really treats our students, students with respect, um, with a welcoming community, and doing that through opportunities for mentorship, uh, opportunities for professional development, as well as a community that is free from microaggressions and other aspects of their experience that might be distracting to them. So those are kind of the three issues that I see that are our challenges as well as our opportunities for diversity and inclusion in law schools. Great. Th thank you, Dean. Dean Bolt. Thank you, Ken and Kelly, for including me in this uh, panel. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing in George Mason. Our focus has been, uh, and this is something we started a, a little over a year ago with a program, a certificate program we have on diversity and inclusion. But a lot of it is aimed towards preparing our students for the job, for the, for the marketplace that they're going to enter, to make them ready to work as um, and law firms or any, any other type of diverse environment to appreciate the benefits of diversity and inclusion after they leave law school, to prepare them so that they're ready to 
go to work for a major law firm, which may have a strong emphasis on diversity and inclusion programs there, so that they can articulate that. So our students can actually take a program and now a course on diversity and inclusion uh, that where they hear from a lot of speakers. And we've had a real champion on this, um, an alum of ours, Kelly McNamara Corley, has been the general counsel of Discover Financial Services for over 15 years. And that company has an incredible track record on diversity and inclusion issues. And she gives a talk entitled The Market Case for Diversity and Inclusion, which is a very compelling case that she brings together and I think captures a lot of the, the ideas and concepts of the, the benefits of having a diverse uh, workforce, uh, but also uh, talks a lot about how you make a diverse workforce come, come, to, come to fruition uh, in a large organization like she's worked with, and also the, uh, the activities of working with the, the major law firms that uh, provide services to her. So that's kind of where we are, is, is uh, focusing on uh, taking the students that we have and, and getting them ready for the future. But of course, we hope that plays back in a more diverse workforce, a uh, diverse group of students to our school as well. Great, so, you know, thank you, Henry. Uh, Ms. Ogden, uh, as someone who's been around for a while, I certainly know about Clio and, and the important role that it's played in legal education, but as you make your opening remarks, um, I, we also wanna be sure that everyone understands uh, the history and what Clio does in legal education. Thank you. I'd like to um, take a few minutes and do what I call an all about Clio. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is our 50th year in operation. We celebrated 50 years of championing education, diversity, and greater equality in 2018. And we were founded back in 1968 when the legal profession was less than 1% minority. And at that time, there were probably um, very few minorities and they were primarily African-American. We've come a long way in 50 years, but we still have a long way to go. Our flagship program is the six-week pre-law summer institute, which was founded back in 1968, when we held four programs, one at Denver, UCLA, uh, Harvard, and Emory. The idea of the pre-law summer institute was to give students an opportunity to demonstrate to law schools, traditional law schools who previously had no idea where to find us, it, it gave students an opportunity to demonstrate that they could do the work and be successful in law school. And it gave law schools an opportunity to recruit these students into their um, student body. This program was so successful in the early days that law schools began to replicate these programs at their own institutions. And in addition to the Clio National Program, which was funded with federal dollars, many LEO programs, legal educational opportunity programs, grew up at various law schools. So for example, if law school ABC had a LEO program, the students who participated in their LEO program would then go on to law school at their institution. So it was a very successful way to increase the number of students of color who were enrolled in law school. Um, like anything else, when your dollars are or leave you, then you have to refocus and re-engineer yourself. So that happened to us in 1996 when we lost federal funding and we had to implement a different model. So at that point, things changed, but we were committed to our flagship program, our six-week summer institute, which we continued to sponsor until, 19, until 2001, when we again got federal funding to support our programs. But this time we became a full service pipeline program working with students in high school to expose them to the opportunities available to practicing lawyers and working with college students to prepare them for the application process and then providing our law, serve, our law school students with academic, financial and professional development support while they were in law school and also preparing them to take the bar exam. Unfortunately, bad news hit again in 2011 and we lost federal funding, but we continued a modified version of our programming. So today we have several programs directed at students from high school through the bar. However, they're just not as extensive as they were when we had federal dollars. Um, so that's pretty much what we do. One of the programs that we're really um, excited about we started three years ago. It's called CLIC, Clio Legally 
Clio legally inspired cohort. And it was modeled after the Posse program, which was a program, which is a program for high school students to prepare them to go off to college in a cohort. So we take students who LSAT scores are uh, less than stellar, whose GPA may be less than stellar, but we use a holistic approach to identifying these students. And I'm really pleased to report that we had 15 students enter the program in uh, three, three years ago. They're third year students now. And 14 of those students will be graduating in June. And these are students who, but for the CLIC program, which sent them off to four law schools in groups of four, they would not have had an opportunity to become members of the legal profession. So we're really excited about this initiative. And our goal is really to expand this program so that more students can have an opportunity to attend law school. Thanks, Ms. Ogden. Wonderful background. Thank you for bringing us up to date about uh, Clio Inc. I now want to call on uh, Kelly Testi. Probably needs no introduction, but a former law school dean, past president of the American Association of Law Schools, and president and CEO of LSAC. Thank you, Ken. And I want to thank all the panelists today for terrific opening remarks. And uh, in our, as we transition to some questions, I want to set just a little bit of a contextual background in that on the bad news side of things, it's clear that the legal profession is still lagging the demographics of our larger society. Uh, no matter what racial subgroup you look at, the population numbers overall uh, are much uh, greater than what we see in the legal profession. On the good news side of things, um, when you look at most every racial subgroup today, you see that college graduation rates are, um, are pretty well matching and uh, the, the admission to law school. So in other words, for most demographics, we're seeing that students are applying to and being accepted to law school in numbers that are at or in sometimes greater than uh, the college graduation rates. Now that means that law schools have done a good job uh, in terms of making progress. But it also means that we have a difficult problem because that means that college graduation rates, since law is a graduate program, also need some attention in order for us to do better. So I wonder if we could uh, ask maybe Dean Rosado Perea to begin and talk a little bit about that larger pipeline issue that you mentioned and just how law schools can think about the entire progression uh, from high school through college and then on into law school and, in, and then on into the profession as well. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I, it is it is something that we really need to keep a, a real eye on. And, and as we know, it's, it's not just in high school, maybe even pre-high school. Uh, and I think one of the things we need to start talking about and reaching out to communities is why law? Why would law be in a, a, a career in which you could make a difference? And we know that students want to make a difference. They want careers that make a difference. So we start there. Why is a profession something desirable for you? And then we need to reach back and to try to build the skills as well. So we have, um, as Cassandra was stay, saying, collaborations with Clio, collaborations with ILSA. So we bring in Latino students from all over the region and, and schools from all over the region so they can see and be part of law school and get a taste of it, even from the high school and get an introduction to it. And then I think in college, we need to be then targeting students who have an interest in, in law, uh, in all sorts of, you know, all sorts of colleges, community colleges, other kinds of colleges, because we also know that even though the college graduation rates are higher for those of students of color, that they, they, they do achieve baccalaureate degrees in lower proportion than, uh, than, than, than their Caucasian or their white peers. And so we need to be reaching back and helping them prepare. So if those white students who are learning mostly from their parents or from family members about law school, we need to give that information, reach back proactively actively and provide information uh, to students. We have, and I'm sure others have, legal, we call, call it legal track, where we bring in a group of college students over the summer and give them a boot camp in LSAT preparation and how to afford law school, all those things. And then as we move them into law school, have other programs that can help them 
along the way. So here in Chicago, we have the DAP program, which is designed for women of color, that it is this, this full on 360 mentorship and professional development. And for all of our students from underrepresented groups, whether they're veterans or whether they're um, students who are first generation, that we need to get them uh, connected with people who are like them, affinity groups, mentoring, so that they can be guided throughout their law school career and really feel like they belong and they can find their way in the practice of law. So those are just a few touch points along the journey that we can really pull many more students along to succeed in law school. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm actually uh, with you today while I'm in Orlando at the LSAC Equality Conference, which is focused on uh, helping admission deans and diversity officers continue to diversify their classes. But the points you make about pipeline building are just so, so important. Um, I want to ask uh, Dean Butler for his remarks and thoughts on the pipeline building issue as well, given its stature. Well, it's, uh, it's an obvious challenge for us. Uh, we're fortunate to live in, uh, in Northern Virginia, which has one of the most diverse populations of anywhere in the country, and that has uh, led us to have a uh, fairly diverse uh, student body, I think as, as diverse as any of the other uh, law schools in Virginia. Um, we have a very diverse uh, faculty, uh, student recruitment team, uh, which tries to make the place, the, the school, seem like a much more, a very welcoming place to everyone. Um, uh, but the pipeline is a, is a key part of the process, obviously, the more we get in, the more choices we have, the more options we can make available. Um, so, um, you know, but we like to talk about what we're doing to get them ready after they come to, to school at, at uh, Scalia Law to get them ready to participate in a diverse and inclusive environment where many of the law firms you may be working with, uh, many of the companies that you may uh, uh, work for have diversity inclusive initiatives. And we want our students, all of them, to understand what that means in a very practical day-to-day uh, -day function uh, as a lawyer. So that's a little bit of a different perspective, I think, than others have, but it's very important. We think it's going to help our students uh, when they're entering the job market and have better outcomes on at the end of that pipeline. Very good. Very good. Dean Washburn, I know that uh, you're a frequent speaker about equity and inclusion in law. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this issue and maybe even a little bit about your own journey into, into the profession. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. One of the things we know is that there's a pipeline that needs to be wide, bigger, right? It's, it's too narrow. We need to expand the pipeline and we need to make it less le leaky. And um, um, Kelly remarks the fact that it has gotten a little bit less leaky, right? We've got a good connection between undergrad and law school. People aren't falling out there. If they graduate from undergrad, they come to law school. But one of the things we've learned recently, is in, before the JD study that the LSAC, among others, helped to fund, we learned that most people who go to law school actually thought about it in high school or earlier. And think about most of our diverse um, groups. Most of our diverse groups may not have even had a lawyer before high school or, you know, or even in college for that matter. So how do we expand so that we get those people? And I will tell you, I am in that group. I was raised by a single mother and um, one of the, in a, you know, I'm Native American from Oklahoma. And um, one of the people I met early on when I was in about fourth or fifth grade was a lawyer. And um, you know, that stuck with me because I just liked him a lot. It, it, you know, he was an interesting guy and um, he was a friend of my mom's. And um, I, I, I had that experience. I didn't come from a wealthy background, but I had met at least one lawyer and <laughs> I respected because people obviously respected him. So I, this is really important stuff. And I think one of the things we've all, we've all wanted to do things in preschool probably, but we thought, gosh, the payoff is too far out. We need to focus more closely. It sounds like we're doing a good job of reaching the, the college level. Uh, we need to start focusing on high school and junior high and really teaching students at a younger age so that, so that it's in their mind. Um, if they can't see it, they won't be it, right? They're not going to go to law school if they can't imagine it. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Ogden, I want to get your thoughts on this too, working as closely as you do with these young people that are wanting to go to law school. Um, you know, how are you seeing, you know, the, the things that are encouraging and the things that matter most in, in keeping their passion and encouraging them to continue uh, uh, their work to become lawyers and legal professionals? 
Well, one thing I think we can do better is really try to identify the pre-law advisors that work with these students when they're in college. And it's really challenging because oftentimes it's an other duty as assigned, particularly at your historically black colleges and universities and your Hispanic serving institutions. Uh, so there's not someone, they may be in career services or they may be in the political science department. But I think to the extent that we can um, kind of do a better job of actually, and I know LSAC has done a lot of work in trying to identify who these individuals are, but that's the key to really giving the students the information and the support that they need while they're in the application process. The other thing that we've been trying to do and we have to continue do a be doing a better job at that is really helping students understand how to select a law school when they're in the process of applying to law school. So often students get uh, caught up in rankings and things that are irrelevant to them. I mean, there are so many factors that they need to look at. What is it that they want to do when they graduate? What school has the best program that will fit them? Are they better in a large classroom setting or a small classroom setting? So to the extent that we can get students to be more realistic in the law schools that they're applying to, because so many of our students could be admitted to law schools, but they misapply to law schools that would actually accept them. So I think that's one area where we're having seepage. Thank you so much. And it's a, it is a good reminder. I want to note for all the pre-law advisors out there that LSAC certainly strives to be a hub for all of you. And uh, we help organize the various regional groups. And um, that's something that anytime we can be of service, we really want to be. I remind you all too that we have a directory that we do with the ABA of all the pre-law pipeline programs um, and also fund a number of uh, pipeline programs each year and try and help the law schools build those. So please know that any way we can be of assistance that we really wanna, wanna do so. Um, I wanna ask each of you to um, maybe give a word to directly to applicants today. Um, you know, we have a number of people viewing um, and a number of those are hopeful applicants wanting to enroll in law school. So why is it a good time to go to law school right now? And what are some of the things that you want to say directly to those applicants? And uh, I'll uh, start with you, Dean Butler, and then uh, and give everybody a chance to speak to uh, the applicants that we hope will uh, follow in the footsteps of others and join our profession. Well, thank you, Kelly, for putting me on the spot with this one. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the market is, uh, uh, for, for, for the graduates of law school, drives up so, so much of what's going on. And uh, the market's very dramatically around the country. Uh, being in the Washington, D.C. area, the, the market for lawyers has remained pretty strong. And we have a, a nice mixture of uh, private sector and state and local government, as well as the federal government here. Uh, but the decision to go to law school is something that, it, you know, it's a huge investment for, for people. And I really like to see students who, who maybe wait for a few years after graduating from college to make sure they really want to go to law school. It's a big investment. Uh, and I think the more mature students are generally uh, uh, make better students and are really prepared for the, for the end of that pipeline when they get there. So I, I'm a, a, a big believer in taking a little bit of time off to make sure you really want to, want to do it. Thank you. Uh, Dean Rosado Perea. Well, I would say it's a great time for uh, students to come to law school, uh, particularly students from underrepresented populations. I think it's a more supportive environment than it's ever been. I think that law school is, although there's a lot of debt, it's more affordable than it has been. Uh, there are scholarships that are available to students. I think that if you want to make a difference and you want to be a problem solver in this society with all that's going on around us, uh, I think law school is the place to go to be be that to be that point person, whether you were working with individuals or communities. And I think that there's just so much, many more opportunities than when I went to law school in 1984 for mentoring and the ability to really be supported in law school in a, in a respectful uh, and, really, and really holistically supportive environment. So I think it's a great time to go. Um, and there's many more of us that are diverse also in leadership positions. And I think that makes a difference too. That's excellent. Thank you. Ms. Ogden, your thoughts uh, directly to the, the applicants today. Well, I think it's all, anytime is a good time to go to law school. I, and I think now is especially a good time. I spoke with some students a couple of 
months ago, and I asked them, is there any area of life that law doesn't touch from the time that we're born until our, until we take our last breath? The law impacts everything that we do. And the students couldn't think of one area with, that the law didn't impact, whether it's the food we eat or the clothes that we buy or the car we drive, the air we breathe, the law impacts everything. And so there's so many opportunities for people who have a passion for making, improving the quality of life for others. No matter what area you want to work in, the law will be there to help you along the way. So I just believe that students should pursue that passion that they have and that the law will assist them. Very good. Dean Washburn. Come to law school because you can change the world. I think that's, that's a big message. If anybody has seen this extraordinary musical that Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, created called Hamilton, you know that lawyers are a key part of American history. And, um, and they were white men, wealthy white men. Um, we've improved. Uh, we've made perfect as they implored us to do. And it has gotten a lot better. But that's one of the things about law school is you can change the world for, uh, by being a lawyer. And um, the United States tend to, tends to turn to lawyers in times of crises. And we tend to turn to lawyers for leadership. More than half the presidents of the United States have been lawyers. There's a reason for that. So I think that law school will always be attractive to those people who want to make the world a better place. And uh, now is as good a time as any. We need you. That's great. I appreciate that. And I want to remind our candidates, too, for law school that you know, you're, you're not your test score, you're not your GPA, you're a real, a whole person. And that's really what our schools are looking for. They want to know you. And we really need your voice in the law. So make sure that you know that uh, our schools are really committed to holistic evaluation of, uh, of the applicant's files. Now, Deans and Ms. Ogden, I want to turn to a, a related subject, which is that when these candidates come to your schools and, and are thinking about law school, they also want to make sure that the programs, the people, that they'll be welcome there and that there are role models for them. So I wonder if you could speak, uh, each of you, to how you're creating a climate in your law school of equity and inclusion. You know, everything from faculty and staff hiring to curriculum. Uh, what are all the ways that you're making sure that as those applicants come to you, they're going to find a, a home where they can thrive? Um, let me throw that one to you, Dean Washburn, first, and uh, we'll go around. You know, one of the things we've been doing at the University of Iowa that I really enjoy is we have a diversity committee. And it's not the faculty diversity committee or the staff diversity committee. It's the law school diversity committee. And we have students driving it, but we have faculty that are very engaged and staff that are very engaged. And um, they've got subcommittees like recruitment and climate, you know, on, on important issues. And so we have had a really great interaction we kind of are constantly, they meet every two weeks at 8 a.m. on a Thursday morning, right? They're really committed. Everybody that's in the States, and I participate when I can. And um, we sort of constantly do a 360-degree evaluation of what we're doing at the School of Law around diversity issues and, um, and making sure that we are at a, a place of inclusion. And that takes constant monitoring and constant work, frankly, and um, I feel really good about how we're doing it. We still have a lot of challenges, but hard on it. Thank you. Uh, Dean Rosado Perea, uh, your thoughts on the climate and, and how to create a welcoming environment? No, I agree with, uh, with uh, Dean Washburn that you've got to get a lot of people around the table even talking and thinking about diversity and inclusion. So I have just, you know, and, and even if you're a person who's diverse, you know, you can't do it all by yourself. You need constituencies. So we, we've done something similar in having a diversity council that students and faculty and staff and alumni thinking together on how to improve the experience for our students. But I think we also are trying to educate and train our students from orientation um, through graduation and bringing in diversity and inclusion and, and inclusive leadership training for our students from the minute they get in. This is a value and we're going to share that value together. We're also doing uh, trainings on implicit bias and stereotype threat for our faculty and staff because this is something new for them as well. And so all of that and in terms of hiring, just being very conscious on every hire, whether it's an adjunct faculty member or a 
staff member, uh, that everybody is, is as diverse on all sorts of different spectrums to make sure that students see a community that is diverse, that they feel like that they can belong. And I think ultimately, as one of my students talked about, you really want to create a community of, of openness and mutual respect in which you can have the difficult conversations with collaboration and civility. Very good, very good. Dean Butler, your thoughts on that topic? Well, the, 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 the point about openness and respect is one that um, strikes near and dear to my heart, that I think it's really important for the communication side of this. And we focus a lot at our school on an open and competitive marketplace of ideas where everyone should feel free to express whatever they, their views are, to express their views that may have been formed by their differences in the background. Uh, and we really strive to make sure that, that, that people can say what they want to say and have it heard and not be shut down. And so we, we oftentimes to neglect um, those viewpoints. We also neglect ideological diversity lots of times. And I'm sure many of you are aware of our school's reputation as a libertarian slash conservative oriented school. Uh, we don't back away from that, but we do like to stress to everyone. And I, I talked to hundreds of our admitted students about the uh, the valuing of diversity of ideas, of ideological perspectives, not that we have a particular brand, but what I do like to say is that everybody who, frankly, and don't take this as whining, but many of the people who are libertarian or conservatives, where they went to law school, uh, were treated as uh, not necessarily respected for their views, and uh, we've been on that side of the equation. I always talk to students when they come to our school that they can expect to be treated fairly and openly and we've all been on the other side of this just like many other people uh, from diverse backgrounds have and that we've stressed that we are a vibrant and open marketplace of ideas. Very good. Ms. Ogden, I want to hear a little bit from your perspective <clears throat> in terms of what um, what makes it more likely that the applicants once they're in law school are going to be successful because I have to tell you, as you celebrated your 50th anniversary, I was so impressed to see so many of the of the wonderful lawyers now that it started with your programs and uh, just how much they they thrive. What are the kinds of things in law school that make a difference so that the students, once they're there, really can thrive and, and join our profession? Well, so many of our students have never actually been exposed to the Socratic method or legal analysis or critical thinking. And so the six week summer institute and also our weekend program give students an opportunity to actually experience what a law school class is like. Um, so often we actually think we know things that we don't need. And I've seen so many students develop over their three years in law school when they began as first year students, their thinking was very lineal. Uh, and then when they, by the time they graduated, they were really much more outstanding. They, some of them make law review and they have excellent opportunities for jobs. But one thing I'd like to mention uh, with our students is that during the six week summer institute, institute, they also have an opportunity to develop relationships with other students of color so that when they go off to law school, whether they go to one in the Northeast or the Southwest or California or Minnesota, they still have those relationships that they can call on in times of need or just in terms of support. Uh, and oftentimes it's nice to have someone who's not actually in your study group to talk over a, a, a concern with. And the other thing is with our students who are part of our CLIC program, for example, we sent five students to the University of Idaho and they worked together as a cohort, but we also made sure in sending the students there that there was not only a nurturing component at the law school to support them, but also that we were able to support them so that all, although they were in Idaho, which has a very low population of African-Americans, they had each other, they had us, and they had people at the law school who were dedicated to their success. That's, that's excellent. I'm really happy to hear that. And I do want to also note that, you know, here at this Equality Conference that we're uh, hosting today, there's a wonderful talk this morning about creating an inclusive environment for LGBTQI plus students. And uh, we're going to post that on our website. There were just so many very tangible uh, points that can help make clear that the institution is 
welcoming in, uh, in a very broad sense. And so we'll uh, certainly let all the law schools know when that goes up so they can uh, benefit from that. Although I think we have a representative from most schools here today, so they'll also know that. Um, I want to turn the, uh, the conversation to um, a little bit more in depth about the admission process. Um, we had a number of people that were anticipating the event today ask um, how admissions officers and how deans should be thinking about admission in a climate right now where we're seeing a good bit of litigation at the undergraduate level. And uh, just uh, if you have any advice for schools as they're conducting their admission process right now in terms of how uh, they might think about that and, and respond. So let me uh, ask um, uh, Dean uh, Rosato Perea uh, to maybe begin our discussion of that and, uh, and offer any advice that you might like to share today. Well, I, you know, I, I think that, that what we're all striving to do is to have, as you mentioned before, Kelly, this holistic admissions process. And it's, it's a little bit hard with the applications, you know, as, uh, in the materials as, as they are. Um, and that's something, obviously, we'll have a conversation about how to maybe have a more expansive uh, application uh, to allow that to happen. But I think a holistic process is what, what we want. We want to look at background. We want to look at experience. Uh, we, we want to look at academics. But there are some things for example, looking carefully at a file um, that you can glean about work ethic, about passion, about perseverance, and all of that matters. So, for example, so, you know, and, and to be really sensitive as you're looking at files, for example, a student who didn't have a chance to be a gover you know, government uh, president may have had to work 30 or 40 hours a week, but that in and of itself shows perseverance and leadership and character in ways. And so what I, all, uh, what I encourage uh, you know, our, our, our directors to do is all Always to look at the whole person and look at the whole class because we want the class to be well-rounded as well and also how they fit with the law school and its incension mission of service and dignity and respect and all of that matters um, and so it's hard to do but I think it's really important to give that holistic process and so there's another no one factor that is determinative. Very good, very good. Dean Butler, your thoughts? Well, we certainly have what we would characterize as a holistic approach to, to evaluating the applications. We have um, a couple uh, readers of the files that do the rankings of the files. Um, we're very merit-oriented in terms of the traditional things, but we're also looking for different experiences. So the problem with the tight market that we've been experiencing, that we, we, we don't have as many options of, of things to, to teachers, characteristics to to look at. Um, but we work very, very hard to talk to the students. We have our admissions uh, staff talks to everyone who's kind of conceivably in our, our range of, of folks. Uh, I talk to all the admitted students to try to encourage them to come to the school. It takes a huge amount of time. Uh, a lot of times after speaking, talking to these folks, I learn more about their backgrounds, the challenges that they face and their, their uh, passion for going to school and take, take a recommendation back to the, to the scholarship uh, committee to see if we can provide some more support for them. Um, these are very labor-intensive activities, though. And uh, we also like to talk about our efforts that we've created on the diversity and inclusion uh, programs we have at the school as, as basically a way to let, let people know that they are welcome at our school, regardless of their background or ethnicity. Very good. Dean Washburn. Well, let me say this. No human is one dimensional. No law school applicant is one dimensional. Um, there are so many different factors that we have to consider, consider. And that's why we often call it a whole file review. People have various talents and attributes and personality types. And we can't essentialize people by assuming that you know, every Latina thinks alike or something like that, right? They don't. Everybody has different views and so it's um, really important just to be really thoughtful we read our uh, I think all of our, our, appli our application officials our admission officials read carefully the applications and especially focus on the essays because that's where you often get a real sense of people and a real sense of what drives them and um, you know we know now um, also because of the before the JD survey I, guess, I think that's where it came from but why people are applying to law school and they often are driven by wanting to give public service or to change the world um, and to advocate for people in need. And so that's the kind of stuff that's really important and it tends to come through, through not necessarily in an LSAT score or a GPA, 
but in the activities of a student. And we care about those things. And um, we want people who are ambitious and who want to change the world. And I think that goes for all of us um, on the call. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Ogden, you work with so many young people thinking about law school. And are there any messages you'd like to send to, uh, to deans and to those of us who are in legal education and trying to open those doors wide? What else can we do to be helpful? Well, um, we have four schools that accept our CLIC students. And these are students, we have to, we conduct interviews, online interviews, Zoom interviews with all of our CLIC applicants because you can really get a different sense when you interview. I know it takes a lot of time and resources, but because we're a small organization, we, we have to do that. And it really gives you a different perspective from what you actually just read on paper. But our goal is by 2025 to have 25 law schools partner with us to accept our CLIC students because these are students who have demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate that with nurturing and the right support that they can graduate pass the bar examination and become outstanding members of the legal profession. And that's what our goal is. So we're looking forward to expanding the program to create opportunities for students who otherwise may not have an opportunity to become members of the legal profession. Thank you so much. And uh, we've had a couple of questions come in online and uh, I just want to address a, a couple of those. And then I want to ask each of our panelists to please share a closing remark with us as we wrap up our time today. Um, a couple of the questions came in from applicants saying, you know, how upfront should I be in my application about who I really am? And I want to share there that I think that every dean I've ever talked to and every admission dean has said, be you, because what you're looking for is a really good fit with the law school. And so being upfront about who you are and all the different identity characteristics and Obviously, we're not even just one, you know, all of us have intersectionality. And uh, so really being you in your application is really, uh, I think, the best advice for finding the right fit. And be open-minded about your schools. There's 200 schools out there plus. There are amazing law schools uh, in all parts of our country and uh, just wonderful faculties and staffs waiting to, to be the right match. So you know, be uh, broad-minded about where you apply, visit, you know, really think about that school and learn about it. And I think the uh, really being you in that application is, is really what the schools want to see. Um, I know that um, for many applicants, uh, there is some, always some concern about, will I only be my GPA? Will I only be my LSAT score? And uh, many schools look very broadly. And so I want to make sure you know that there's help with those. You know, remember the Khan Academy is free LSAT preparation, and it's wonderful skill building for that on-ramp to law school as well. So please know that LSAC and really all of our law schools are there for you. We want to encourage you uh, and help you on your pathway into the legal profession. So let me uh, begin with Dean Butler and then ask everybody to make a, a closing remark today uh, as we uh, uh, in this program on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Anything you'd like to share that maybe we haven't covered uh, that you think is important for this topic? Dean Butler? Well, thank you, Kelly. Uh, <laughs> this is an incredibly important topic and one that's gonna be with us for a long time. And I think it's uh, worth uh, everyone investing a lot into it. At uh, Scalia Law School, we've launched our uh, Center uh, for Diversity and Inclusion Education with the, the gift of, from that uh, Alum I mentioned earlier, Kelly McNamara Corley, and we will be holding uh, an annual conference on diversity and inclusion education, how, what we can do as educators to uh, improve the presentation of uh, diversity and inclusion um, initiatives uh, within schools. We had the first program was uh, early November. Uh, we had representatives from 50 law schools there. This will be an annual event for us. We hope to be providing uh, online materials a uh, speaker's bureau, uh, and uh, basically a template to do a certificate program or to do a four credit course on diversity and inclusion. So stay tuned for more information from us on this. Thank you. Ms. Ogden? <clears throat> I just like to tell students that law school is not difficult, but it takes hard work. 
you do have to be committed to the journey because it is a journey. It's a new way of thinking. It's a new way of looking at things. But we need students of all backgrounds in the legal profession. And I hope that they will be serious about this journey and that they will just join our profession. Thank you. Dean Washburn. Yes, so I, I would say um, a couple of things. One is that I, I feel that law school efforts are much more sincere now than they've ever been. I think there was a time when we all mouthed the words diversity is important. And if as long as we could get some, you know, some statistics in the numbers, we would say, okay, that's, we did it, done, we're, we're done. You know, with the addition of equity and inclusion, I think we've become much more aware that there's a lot more to diversity and making it meaningful than just trying to, you know, get some numbers. And so that's one of the main ways that legal education has really improved in the last few years. Another thing is the focus on implicit bias and microaggression. We all are paying so much more attention to those things these days. Most of that is not out of malice. When it happens, a microaggression happens or implicit bias happens, it's so often not out of malice, it's out of ignorance. And um, a lot of people really want to be better and when you tell them how, they, 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 they do better. And um, I feel like the environment in law schools is improving dramatically around those issues. I to go to law school because of that. And, um, you know, it's a challenge again. It's a challenge in some law schools. But I think all law schools are very committed to diversity these days and making the law school an inclusive environment. And I think we're doing a lot better than we ever have in history. We have a long way to go, but we're doing better. Thank you so much. And Dean Rosato Perea. Yes, thank you. You know, I think that law schools are a microcosm of society. And so the issues that we're seeing, whether in speech or microaggressions, all of those issues are mirroring themselves in the law schools. I think I have been very inspired by my students, honestly, who are identifying the issues, who are making sh making us all accountable um, in all ways to making their environment better. So I think we can be a model. I think we also have to push the pipeline forward into the profession to make uh, the firms and the organizations that our students go to also more diverse and inclusive. And I think that's our task as deans as well. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on for the fight and for the progress that we've made. <laughs> Well, I'm really glad that we have all of you with us on this. And I, I think, uh, Dean Rosado Prey, you've given us a topic for a future webinar because I think we do need to talk about the entire pipeline and on into the, into the profession where we do see some, some drop offs in terms of numbers that have come out of law school. So uh, stay tuned for more, uh, more information on that. And uh, Ken Randall, I'll turn it back to you. And uh, with that, just please know law schools and candidates, the Law School Admission Council is always here for access and equity in legal education. Let us know how we can help. Thanks, Ken. Dick Kelly, thank you. We want to thank our four speakers. Uh, several hundred people have logged in and watched. We also will archive and put this on the LSAC and the ILAW websites. We have some great programs coming up. Uh, in March, we have what Kelly's calling March Madness. We'll be focusing on uh, U.S. news rankings. Mm -hmm. In February, uh, live with Kelly and Ken, we'll focus on law school financing. Uh, and then we will do the next uh, Kelly and Ken live uh, from the AALS annual conference, Thursday, January 6th. Uh, we will focus on law and technology. So we hope everyone has a great holiday. Thank you, speakers, and thank you, audience. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Onward and upward.